verse 14. Also Paul writing, read, uh, speaking here, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So then, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives submit, oh no, never mind, that's not part of it. <laughs> Let the church say amen. amen. You can be seated this morning. Hallelujah. I don't know. There are just certain scriptures just people stirred up just all the all sudden. But I want to talk about living a deeper life. I'm concerned as we look over the past number of years at our churches and then over the past few years as we've seen this uh, pandemic transpire and come across our world that tells us a little bit about the condition of who we are as a church. And my concern with the church is, is that have we been going through the motion and or, or are we going through the motion today and do we need a deeper walk with the Lord? And uh, if you would... Uh, Look at your own life and do an evaluation on your life on your own life. The Apostle Paul said sometimes we need to examine ourselves yeah. whether we we are in the faith or not. Amen? Amen. And if your Christian life only consists of popping into church a few times a month, I think I'd be reevaluating my Christian life. Amen. If all your Christian life consists of is talking a little Christian talk every once in a while, I think I would reevaluate where I am in my relationship with the Lord. One Christian writer wrote one time one of the most dramatic pictures that the earliest Christians used in describing their experience at Pentecost was tongues of fire descending on each of them. Fire is a, an example of a glowing and a powerful spirit, an ardent spirit. It is the opposite of what is cold and what may be frozen. And it must be something that the psalmist had in mind when he wrote in Psalms 104 when he said the Lord makes his ministers a flame of fire. I believe that God wants to touch the church that we're not a dead dry religion but we are people that have laid eyes on the king and we've been touched by the Lord today. Amen. Amen. <laughs> the fire of the church of the living God is in contrast to the things that we see in the world today. Prominent fear and anxiety that has come upon our world. There are people that at this our news media and our government has tried to put fear upon people. Afraid to gather at Christmas time. Afraid to be with your family during Thanksgiving. Afraid to go out in public because you might catch some kind of a virus and if it was up to them we'd all be walking around in astronaut suits. I, hallelujah to God today. But God said I never gave you a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Hallelujah to God. If anybody ought to be voicing for the world today, it ought to be coming out of the pulpits of America that God is still God and God is still in control today. Our world is looking for meaning. We're looking and they come up with meaninglessness. We are looking for power, but we become to so find out that we're powerlessness. And we look to the future and we cringe in fear of the things that are coming upon us and upon our world today. Our world has uh, shifted its fear from uh, people are not afraid so much anymore. We used to have people, we used to be afraid of hell, the, the thought of burning in hell for eternity. Laura was talking this morning and she said, I think people I want to go to hell. They Some people in their mind act like they want to go to hell. And I said they may want to go to hell because maybe some of their friends they think maybe is going to be there. But the only people that would want to go to hell is people that don't really know what hell is all alive because they've never lived in an existence without the presence of God. You might be lost this morning. You may be a drunk or a vagabond.
come on. You may not be a Christian today, but God is still present. His spirit is still in this world. You don't know what it's like to be without the presence of God today. Anybody that knows anything about hell don't want to go to hell. But somehow the church has found itself entwined in the snare of the world. And this generation has shifted their fear of going to hell to the fear of, uh, of, of mental problems and the fear of mental incapabilities, the fear of things that are going on in the mentality. And uh, they're more afraid of that than they are going to hell. But I tell you what, you don't need to be afraid as much of what's going on in the here and now as to what's going to go on in the there and after. Amen. Because just as sure as there's a heaven, there is a hell today. And those that die without God, that is where they're going. But somebody said we're looking for answers today, preacher. We've got the scientist. We've got the physicist. We've got the psychologist and the psychiatrist. But I tell you, there is a solution today. And he died over 2,000 thousand years ago and rose again with power in his hand. Jesus is still the answer for our dilemma today. Yes. Hallelujah to God. Two thousand years ago what we need is that 2,000 years ago 2,000 years ago from that outpouring of the Spirit 2,000 years ago away from those tongues appearing as fire and setting upon each of those that were in the church. I, I tell you, if there's anything that we need today, we don't need no more Dr. Fauci's. We don't need no more politicians. I, we don't need no more doctors to tell us what we need to do. We need an old-fashioned Holy Ghost outpouring of the Spirit of the living God that'll put devils on the run and bring healing into the church of God today. I'm telling you, church, we need a deeper love. There's more to God than our Sunday morning sermon. We need to get close to Him today. We need a deeper walk with the Lord. We need a revival of that dove that descended upon Christ in the Jordan River and validated Him as the Messiah. And I identified him with baptism as the one that came to save. We need a revival of the oil that run down his cheeks and out the bee out of his beard onto the skirts of his garment that anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor and the wretched and to give sight to the blind. We need a revival of fire that will penetrate and purify the mildew and the mustiness of the church Hallelujah, that's steeped in ritualism and formality. Some churches you go to, some sermons that you hear, and some sanctuaries and church services you ain't into anymore. It's more exciting to go down to the bar than it is to hear about a God that controls the universe. We've lost our spirit. We've lost our power. We've lost our fire. It's no wonder people's not drawn anymore. You're not drawn to a cold tow bucket, but you're drawn to the fire of a burning ember. I'm telling church, we need to be aflame for Jesus Christ in this hour today. We need to go back to the God of the Scriptures, to a revival of a John the Baptist that comes crying out of the wilderness, makes straight the paths of the Lord. Hallelujah to God. And comes preaching that I baptize you with water under repentance. But he that comes after me, whose shoes that I'm not able to bear, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Huh? We get people into our churches, we try to baptize them with education. We try to baptize them with knowledge, and we need knowledge, we need education. I'm not diminishing those things. And we try to baptize them in all the formalities of the church. And then when you come to church, you've got a form of religion. But you can't find God any there. The, no spirit convicting our heart anymore. No spirit convicted us because we've not read our Bible this week. No spirit to convict us because we've missed a few church services and nobody bothers to care. No conviction anymore that we're not drawing close to God. I, I'm telling you, you can't get close to the fire without being burned. I, and I'm telling you, 
when God is present in our churches, when God is present in our worship, it'll put a desire in us to get close to Him and to follow Him a little closer today. This generation needs a deeper dimension of living to meet the demands of the day in which we live. We're facing a time as no other. Our grandparents and our great-grandparents didn't see the day in which we live. We have been blessed. We have been blessed so much that most of us don't have to worry about heat in the winter and cool air in the summer. We don't have to gather in a barn to have church with the smell of horse manure and straw gathered around a pot belly stove at 20 degrees when it's outside. We don't have to worry about that anymore. We can get in our heated and air-conditioned cars. We can drive on new rubber on the tires. And we can swing by McDonald's and grab a sandwich on the way to church and, and uh, complain and get to church late when we've got all the modern conveniences of the world today. But I'm telling you, if we'll get set on fire today, put Jesus back in his proper place, then we will get to begin to live in a deeper dimension. We need to live in a deeper dimension in God today rather than thinking I need to be prepared to go to church on Sunday. And that's the only thing that you think about church. I, I think that the apostle, when he spoke, spoke about a deeper dimension in a few ways. I'm going to name three. First of all, I think he speaks of a dimension of action. He said, don't be drunk with wine, where is an excess? Now, he was particularly intertwining, using that metaphoric language again, comparing the drunkenness of wine and alcohol with the drunkenness of responsibilities of the world. What he is saying, I don't think we need to be drunk on wine or Jack Daniels or vodka or anything like that either. But what he was saying is we don't need to be so consumed with work and with jobs and business and bills and everything else that we're so drunk we're consumed with the responsibilities of life. He said, but if you'll get filled with the Holy Ghost, if you get filled with the Spirit, and live and walk according to God today. You see, we got all the ingredients. We build buildings and we call them churches. We can compare them to spiritual factories. These spiritual factories, all the shafts are working. They're all set. The cogs are sharp and clean. The workmen are all in place. But the machinery ain't moving. We've got all the stuff we need, but the machinery won't work. We try every method. We try every scheme. We try every program. We try skits, anything we can just to get people to come to church. We will lie to them sometimes as Christians. Just try to get them to come to church. Oh, you're going to have a ball. You're going to love our church. You don't know they'll love our church. We've had a few people walk in our church and head right back on out. They didn't like what was being said. But there's places for you today. There's places out there to preach you anything that you want to hear. But we better be interested in what this has to say. Amen. 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 Hallelujah to God. But that's where Paul comes in. Paul comes in and he says, be filled with the Spirit. Paul comes into our dead, dry churches and he sees all of our mechanics and he sees all of our workmen. He sees all the machinery that is ready, but it's all stuck. Nothing is working. Nothing is moving. Paul walks past our marble uh, church buildings. He ain't interested in that. He walks across our carpeted aisles and that don't impress him. He hears all about our education and Dr. So-and-so and that don't turn him on at all. And then he goes down into the basement. Where is the broiler and the furnace? And he opens up the furnace door that is smoldering because the fire has been dying out and Paul opens it up and throws in the fire and throws in the coal and throws in the fuel and begins to set it on fire that's what the church needs to get function again that's what the church needs for its action one more time we need to be filled with the Holy Ghost of fire today the fire of the Holy Spirit is the brother of the church and the church is a church of action. 
Now, when I use the term Pentecostal, I'm not talking about a denomination. We live in a day and a time that you mention Pentecost, people think of a denomination. And I'm 54 years old, and I've never been in an area that is so ardently against Pentecost than this area here. I've come across so many people that when they hear the word Pentecost, it's like, no. I think I could tell them I went to a satanic church and they would receive me a little better. What is the problem with that? One of the problem is our teachers, pastors, you have done your church a disservice by allowing them to condemn and run down other churches when you might do it from your own pulpit. Amen. Huh? We need to be careful. I'm not here to run down the church down the road. I'm not here to criticize the pastor down the street. But I'm here to preach Jesus and him crucified. And it's pretty strange to me that when Jesus died on the cross and ascended and rose again and ascended back to glory, the first thing that he done is he told his people, don't go out and preach, don't go hand out pamphlets, don't go tell nobody about me until you first be endued with power from on high. And the Bible said they were gathered together in one place in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Honey, you can't get this from Nashville. You can't get it from headquarters. You can't get it from the council. It's got to come from heaven. We need to get back. We need to get back until we hear from heaven one more time today. Well, I didn't mean to preach like this. And I'm done stuck in it. Let me go a few minutes more. I didn't feel too good when I got up here. I'm going to feel a little better now. Hallelujah. Pentecost is a church on the move. When God's Spirit fell on the church on the day of Pentecost, He wasn't establishing a, 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 a denomination. He was setting a precedent of a lifestyle. Why did the disciples... We have a lot of people believe that the... Uh, Gifts of the Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Ghost did all that out with the apostles. Well, <laughs> and we have a lot of people that sit in the pews, and because a guy gets up there with Dr. Ph.D. M. D. J. Co. on the end of his name, they think he knows more than they do. But pray tell me, if it went out with them, why did they go around preaching it to everybody else that they need to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Yeah. Problem is, is they preach that because their fires went out. They preach that because they've lost the fire of God and they're preaching their own thought and they're th preaching their own idea of what God is. But Pentecostal is a genuine move of God's Holy Spirit. It's not a move of the flesh of excitability. God ain't trying to stir you up and make you excited. He's trying to put you on fire that you might testify to a dying world that Jesus is still alive today. It's a dimension of action, but it's a dimension of assurance. You know why a lot of people live defeated lives? It's because they live, a, they live a Christian life unsure that what they're doing is right. Is there really a God? Did all this really happen? They listen to their friends. They listen to the agnostics, the Gnostics, and they listen to uh, modern day religion, the scientists, and everybody else that tries to disprove that there is a God. Scientists say Stephen Hawking. I think he was the guy that developed the black hole theory that discovered these black holes and. At the center of every galaxy, I suppose, is a black hole. And the gravity is so great that even the light cannot escape it. Ooh, that's fascinating. How smart these guys are just turns me up. And I'm thankful for education. I'm thankful for science. And I don't deny science. Because God will prove himself every time. Your science will not ever disprove God. Amen. Never. Disprove God. Now God can cause things to happen. 
And we call it scientific. But it's still God. Amen. But they will take you back, I forget, 4.5 billion years ago. And all of a sudden, Thursday night at 6 p.m., the universe exploded into existence. Pow! And we sat in the classroom with bogged eyes thinking, wow. But if you ask them to stop at the Big Bang and let's go back one second before the Big Bang, they don't want to go there. Because they've not been able to make up a theory yet that works. They say that nothing exploded into something. And you just think about that a minute. I don't know how, what, what year is Kaylee and Kinsley? Are they preschool? Um, Kaylee's in first grade and Kinsley's in preschool. Preschool and first graders. And I guarantee you that both of them have the common sense enough to know that if you got nothing in your hand, there will never be anything in your hand. Right. Right. Nothing, something cannot come out of nothing. And if there ever was a time that nothing existed, there would never be anything that exists now. Amen. I didn't mean to get in on a science lesson. But I tell you, God will prove himself every time. The church needs a deeper dimension. Church, we need to walk in a deeper dimension. This was my desire. My heart throbbed for this sermon a few weeks ago when the Lord put it on my heart was that we as a church, as a body, each one of us individually begin to walk deeper in the presence of the Lord, deeper with the Lord. And when we begin to walk deeper with the Lord, it is a, it is a dimension of action. It will cause us to start doing things for the Lord. What have you done for the Lord since you left here last Sunday? What have you done for the Lord since you left here last Sunday? Come back to church this week. Is that the last thing, the only thing that you've done for Him? You need a deeper walk with the Lord. You need a deeper walk with the Lord. It's a dimension of action, but there's also the dimension of assurance. They assume the actual presence of Jesus in their daily life. That's why so many people live defeated lives is because they leave Jesus at the church on Sunday as if he's some kind of religion or some kind of idol that we come and worship. But he is a living thing, the Holy Spirit. When Jesus left, he poured out his spirit upon the church that we could have him dwelling with us. He said he would never leave us. He would never forsake us today. We must have that dimension of assurance. That Paul had when he thundered out in Romans 8. But he said I'm persuaded neither death nor life. Angels or principalities. Powers or things present or things to come. Height nor death. Any other creature can separate me from the love of God. Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It enables us to share the benefits of Pentecost. And to, to say with the text. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to live. You need to consciously go around with the Lord in your heart and on your mind and in your thoughts today. Because if you don't, the devil's got plenty of stuff to slip in there and fill it up. I mean, you can be praying. And the devil can cause you to hear something and to throw a thought into your mind and pretty soon you're off thinking about 14 other different things and forgot that you was even praying. That's how sly that he is. But Paul said that's why we need to speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns. We need to go around talking to ourselves. The world think you're crazy, but they think you're crazy anyway when they see your car parked at a Pentecostal church. So you might as well go around singing to yourself. <laughs> All people's crazy. They're crazier than we are. I went one place one time and I was going to pray for these people and at that time I'd usually carry a little bottle of olive oil, a little morning oil in my pocket and I went over there and prayed for this lady and scared her to death. She said, you going to put that snake oil on me? I said, snake oil? I ain't no snake oil. Had one old buddy said he loved to hear me preach but when he come he would sit back in the nursery and look through the glass and said, you scared me to death. <laughs> 
I said, you think this is scary? You wake up on judgment day and you don't know the Lord. You don't know what scary it is. Amen. Hallelujah. But we need to live in a dimension of action and a dimension of assurance. And we need this. Amen. We need to live in the dimension of attitude. Oftentimes we need an attitude adjustment. Amen. Even in the church. One of the great dilemmas of modern day Pentecost is that we have so many that claim so much and possess so little. Talk about how great God is, how great God heals, how great and powerful that he is, but our lives show a little bit of it. Too many times we lift up the powers of the Spirit, but our lives talk about selfishness and formalism and pride, even sin. Too many have never even had their subconscious minds flooded and bathed in the power of the Spirit. A lot of folks go to a Pentecostal church and people say, well, what, you know, what uh, denomination are you? And they'll go, you know, well, I'm Pentecostal. But they've never had the Pentecostal experience. They just go to a Pentecostal church. And if you want to go to a Pentecostal church, you might as well seek and find the Pentecostal experience. Yes. Yeah. I know everybody don't believe that, but you've got to read the Bible for yourself. Yeah. And it needs to be taught to you in a manner that, that uh, is correct. Now, I can't tell you everything, and I'm not going to be up here and, and dogmatically teach you that I know everything about how the Spirit works and functions and what He does, but I will tell you that when He fills your life, He will change your life. Amen. Not only will you change your life, there's a lot of people going around babbling in tongues and talking about how holy they are and wearing their skirts to the floor, but they'll cuss you to fly with a light on you. Amen. Talk about you behind your back. Hateful back. Nobody caught that but you, Gil. They, one, they was being merciful. Let me slide on with it. Gil always catch you. That's why we always got to remember to catch him, right? But, but they go around saying they're filled with the Spirit, but they got bad attitudes. And some of the people in Pentecostal churches have some of the stinkiest attitudes I've ever seen in my life. I'm saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Mad at everybody, don't like nobody, nobody's good enough to be their friend, they're better than everybody else. But the great factor of the pouring out of the Spirit was that he changed and transformed the lives of the disciples. Yes. That's what Pentecost is supposed to do. If it's made you worse, you need to come on back down here. We will fill you with the right Spirit this time. Amen. See, before Pentecost, they were selfish. Arrogant. They were arguing, who's going to be the first? I'm going to be the first set beside the Lord in the kingdom. Before Pentecost, they were resentful and vengeful. They run into people that they didn't agree with. They said, should we call fire down from heaven, cause it to burn them up? That ain't Christ-like. Before Pentecost, they were spiritually impotent when they came to the boy that was demon-possessed. Jesus came down off man transfiguration and the disciples said, why couldn't we cast him out? Before Pentecost, they was full of criticism when the woman brought the alabaster box to pour it on the feet of Jesus and worship him. Remember what the disciples said, why are we going to waste that good oil? Before Pentecost, there was prejudice a woman was following them, wanting to know the way of the Lord, and the disciples said, why does she cry after us? Do you want us to just shut her up? Before Pentecost, there was selfishness. They said, Lord, we have left you, and now what do we get? Before Pentecost, there was fear because after Jesus died and ascended, they all gathered in a room and hid themselves afraid of what the Roman soldiers might do. But thank God today there came the hope of the resurrection followed by the baptism of fire and it made these disciples to go out into the world, these disciples that were critical, these disciples that were prejudiced, these disciples that were selfish, that made these disciples to go out into all the world and what scripture said, they've come here and they've turned the world upside down. They was willing to have their heads cut off, be crucified upside down. They was willing to die for this gospel. I'm telling you, we need a closer walk with the Lord that will adjust our attitudes and put us in line with Him today. They learned how to love God. They learned vertical love, but not only that, they learned horizontal love. 
You see, love is gratitude, thankful because of God's gift. Love is loyalty, willing to deny myself. John the Baptist put it like this. He must increase. I must decrease. The disciples had a love. They learned to answer the question, who <laughs> is my neighbor? Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Old Testament law. Yeah. One guy said, who is my neighbor? But the dimension of the Spirit helps us to see our neighbor is not only the person beside us that we see every day, but the neighbor is the person that, we, that lives afar off. My neighbor is the person that cares for me and loves me and seeks to have a relationship with me, but my neighbor is also my enemy that fights against me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rather than coming to church and wanting everything, wanting a Burger King religion, we want everything to go our way. Amen. And we sometimes people come, I've been in a lot of churches where they, it's almost they come in with the attitude, all right, preacher, see if you cannot offend me today. Because they're looking for anything to get upset about. Yeah. And there's a lot of folks will come hang out at your church and participate a little bit until you make them mad. And then they're gone. But you know what? I've been made mad and I'm still here. You can get mad and get over it. But we need to stop worrying about somebody always hurting my feelings. That's what Pentecost does. It brings us to a deeper level. We learn that when these people hurt our feelings that they need something, they're lacking something, but we ought to have enough to be able to look over that and pray for them and go on and don't let it cause us to go home and have to pop a bunch of pills because I can't get over it because she said I was ugly. But being filled with the Spirit is the dimension of assurance and it would seem that we would have the right to claim in the presence of God's Spirit we would have no right to claim the presence of God's Spirit without being obedient to the Scripture that says we need to submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God. This is a dimension of right attitudes. And with this, I'm going to close. Amos preached to us, preached to Israel, and now preached to us that we need to get out of fake and false worship. We need to be honest when we worship God. Yes. Coming to church ain't simply worshiping God. Just because your body walked through them doors, you've not entered into worship. Right. Right. I've worshiped today. Amen. Many of you have worshiped today. Yeah. Some of you has just been here. Yeah. God is looking for a deeper walk. A deeper dimension from his people. And where you walk in your relationship with God will determine the outcome of how your life turns out. I believe that with all my heart. Now, I don't mean if you live for God, everything's going to be perfect and worked out, work out. But as Brother Mark preached this morning about that rest, you'll have that rest in your spirit to know you've done all you can do to stand. The rest of it's in the hands of God. So the stage has been set, and I've set the facts before you this morning. Only thing that's left is your reaction. How are you going to respond to what I've gave you this morning? I've hit you with a hammer. How will you respond to it? Will it be a dull thud and you'll go home today and live just like you always do and never think a thing about God till next Sunday? Or will it cause the sparks fly? Iron sharpening iron. And draw us closer to the presence of God. Will you stand with us all over the house? It's your opportunity today to grasp a new lease on life, to grasp a new walk with God, to say, God, I'm sorry. Do you know that it is? I think that it's a sin. I think it's a sin to not walk close to God when you know you're not as close as you need to be. That's right. Amen. He said, if you know to do good and don't do it, it's sin. Ain't that what he said? Amen. Paul said, Wake up. Wake up. You saved? Start living like you saved. Yeah. Same thing Amos said. If you saved, start living like you're saved. There you go. Amen. 
and let God take you. Don't you want a deeper walk with God? I don't, I don't want to just come to church, play a few songs, preach a sermon, and go home, folks. I want it to change my life to when I get up in the morning, he's on my mind. When I go to bed at night, he's on my mind. When I go through my day and I face my problems, I look to him and call upon him as I face my problems today. I think you want that deeper walk. And those that want that deeper walk can have it this morning. I'm going to ask you, everybody that will, if you'll come, come around this altar this morning with us, find a place of prayer wherever you're at to say come to the music this morning ask God that if it will give